Well, welcome everybody. I hope there's no lag and I hope you can hear me clearly. We seem to have some technology issues in Italy. Uh, however, it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody and to thank Janine particularly for acting as our moderator and for Farmers Weekly to uh, be our partners in hosting this really pivotal meeting. This meeting uh, not only has to unpack the issues, but it also has to arrive at a point where we can decide together what must be done. As you know, fair play is in favor of free trade within the rules. For us, the issue is that unfortunately, the rules are not being applied. We have also seen that the authorities are not applying the rules and they do make new terms. We've invited the Minister of Trade and the Minister of Agriculture, and they have not uh, accepted the offer. It's a great disappointment to us. However, we are encouraged by the enormous participation here. I'm happy to see Isaac Redenbach from the SA Poultry Association, a real expert in the industry. I'm uh, encouraged by Donald Pepe joining us as a trade expert. Uh, I'm ha very happy to see that the best boss of AFMA is here. Uh, Tabili and Kunjana has been uh, replacing a, a colleague, Safisu and Tombella, and he's an agricultural and food expert uh, from an eco economist's point of view. Our wonderful partner, Luka Chonko, from FAWU, is going to bring a very important point of view when it comes to the position of uh, the trade union movement and how they see the issues we are dealing with. We also have Amanda Dodana. She is not only a valuable and knowledgeable person in the industry, but as a small-scale farmer, Representing a large group of small-scale farmers, I firstly want to thank her for contacting us, inviting us to what they are discussing, and now joining us to bring their valuable point of view to us. And so what we are going to do is we're going to also uh, allow uh, the other panelists to talk would be very happy to hear that this is not a monologue. Uh, before that, I also just want to point out that we have, I think, 345 people in this meeting, and many industry leaders, people from other industries, uh, from the milk industry. We have economists and banks joining us. It is vital that this is a proper community meeting. Everyone with a stake in this industry, regrettably, one of the important stakeholders, government, refused to participate. However, let's make the most of the time we have together. I take uh, pleasure in handing over to Janine. And uh, Janine, why don't you introduce everyone on the uh, panel and uh, give, take, take us through our paces. Thank you, Francois. Um, before we start, um, on behalf of Farmers Weekly, I'd like to welcome and thank the panelists here today for their time and expertise. Um, I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to all the delegates and thank you for the time that you've decided to be part of this important discussion. Uh, in the past, discussions around local poultry production um, have been somewhat loaded. Um, which is why this platform is so important for the industry to facilitate a real and honest conversation about the future of local poultry production, um, which is largely driven by the poultry master plan, as well as the role that world trade should ultimately play in local poultry production. 
Uh, so the panelists here today represent key stakeholders in the industry and all have a common goal, which is to see the expansion and improvement of the local poultry industry. Um, so I think instead of me introducing the panelists, I'm just going to ask each of the panelists to just quickly say your name and um, what your role is in the industry. So Isak, I think we'll start with you. I'm Isak Breitenbach. Um, I'm the um, general manager for the broiler organization of SAPA, um, doing all the work for the, the industry um, as, as a collaborative. Uh, good morning, panelists, and also uh, all the members of industry and stakeholders signed into this webinar. I'm David Borsov, the Executive Director of the Animal Feed Manufacturers Association, and we are in full support of SAPA and the South African Master Plan of Poultry. Thank you. Donald? Um, I'm Donald Mackay. I'm the CEO of XA Global Trade Advisors. And um, I've had interesting interactions with the chicken industry over the years. I guess I'm here to talk about what our experience has been of the master plans and what can be done to get a thriving export sector developed in chicken. Sabile. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tabi Lengunjana. I am an agricultural economist within the National Agricultural Council in Pretoria. Uh, so today I'm chipping in for Dr. Sefi Sondombela, who has to attend an emergency uh, with regards to the, some of the issues uh, the department is dealing with and the industry at large. Uh, generally, I'm monitoring prices within the, the food chain unit. Um, Cultural prices is part of that. And we've been engaging with the industry in terms of our writings, in terms of our reports, our policy briefs, and advisor, of course, working closely with the departments like DTI and ITEC, and the, of course, uh, rural development. Thanks. Amanda? Let me show my face. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Amanda. I'm a small scale poultry farmer. I represent a very large. Um, um number of small scale poultry farmers and i do have poultry spaces on twitter um whereby we are trying to develop ourselves and uh, have a foot in the market and be involved in decision making in terms of poultry i'm glad to be here and last but not least Vuka. Thank you very much. My name is Fuka Kongo, the Deputy General Secretary of FAO. We, I'm, I'm representing labor. In this case, we represent workers in general uh, in the poultry sector, but across the agriculture and the entire value chain. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So. Um, just a quick few sort of admin details is that we are going to have a discussion now amongst the panelists. Um, and then after that, we'll open the floor to take some questions from um, the delegates, from the, the audience. Uh, okay, so Isak, let's start with you. Um, could you give us an indication of how much progress has been made with regards to the poultry master plan? I mean, absolutely. Um, I think that um, the poultry growth plan or master plan, as we call it, is not a plan that's going to stop in 2023. Um, this master plan has delivered, and these are new figures, 2.4 billion rand in investment by 20, end of 2023. Um, 2,600 new jobs were created um, in the two years that we're busy with the master plan. Um, we've also seen a 10% increase in the total amount of chickens uh, uh, being produced um, in the industry. Um, we managed in the last two years to establish 18 new contract farmers at, at a value of about 35 million per farm. So these are big producers, um, big businesses that is successfully being established amongst um, black farmers. Um, during this period of time, we managed to train in excess of a thousand people. 
And the turnover in the increase um, is estimated to have increased by about 2 billion rand on the 50 billion rand turnover per annum that we do have in the industry. I think what if we talk about the industry and what has hampered us in the two years that we can do better in time to come, it's the anti-dumping duties against Brazil that we need to uh, get implemented. Um, we absolutely need to get exports going. Um, this industry strategically has to export and we are committed to doing that. We also would like to see a revision and trade measures um, as uh, the report has already been done by ITAC. It's on the minister's desk and he needs to, to, to talk to that. In terms of the consumer, it's important to say that, that we produce the cheapest chicken, the cheapest chicken money can buy or rands can buy anywhere in the world. Um, so we're a competitive industry and we supply have been supplying um, cheap chicken to the industry since 1904. Thank you, Janine. Uh, so just because you mentioned exports earlier, um, why, why have exports not taken off? What are the challenges with regards to, um, to that industry? We probably can say that technology changed. And that facilitated the fact that we uh, is in a position to export now. If we talk about exports, the, the big barrier or the big constraint that causes us not to uh, export um, is phytosanitary measures, disease measures. We, for example, vaccinate for um, Newcastle disease, and that will prohibit us from exporting um, uh, frozen meat to the U European Union. What we have done, and, and we've done a lot of work in the last two years, although, although it hasn't come to fruition yet, is uh, to plan to export cooked product. When we export cooked product, we actually uh, negate the fact that we need to comply with um, Newcastle requirements, highly pathogenic avian influenza requirements, and so forth. So, so those factors prohibited us from exporting. In terms of uh, exporting cooked or partially cooked meat, we only need to comply with the residues that we test for. Those are the residues of growth hormones, residues of, of minerals, and so forth. So uh, that is what changed and what makes it possible for us to, 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 to access the export market. Okay, so um, while we're on the, the topic of exports then, Donald, I'd like to turn to you. Um, so obviously, a major issue of contention in the poultry industry has been um, tariffs and or the lack thereof, let's say. Um, and internationally, they Europe, for example, has um, import tariffs, but they're also supported by subsidies. So, and South Africa obviously doesn't have those subsidies. Um, so what impact do you think this has on South Africa's um, ambitions to grow its agricultural manufacturing um, and exporting base? Yeah, so I think maybe even a general comment before I get to chicken. We, South Africa doesn't, for most sectors, have an export first way of approaching things. We tend to look at the local market produce for it. If we have excess, we move it into export markets. But I think that that whole way of thinking is becoming problematic. We have an economy that is essentially stalled, that is you know, hard to grow this market um, for quite a while, which means exports become extremely important. Um, I take Isak's point that we are a competitive producer, and I actually have no reason to doubt that. Um, if I look at Europe, for example, there was a Europe would like to diversify their supplies of chicken breast, and there's a very large price premium to be obtained getting into that market. Whether the product be, be cooked or uncooked, um, there's value in getting into the market. So it's encouraging to know that we're looking at that. But the way of thinking around exports has got to be a little bit different. The problem is when Astral can't get water uh, at their factory or the roads are not working, whatever the case might be, um, the duties give you some protection to kind of hide behind. Despite the fact that we have duty-free access into the EU, uh, we still have to compete with the EU with all of the other countries, which means we're exporting the infrastructure that doesn't work, the electricity that doesn't work, and those costs are a, a competitive hindrance. So it's 
it's very good and I think it's essential for the long-term survival of the industry that we sort out the export problem. But to do that, you know, and I share Francois's disappointment that that government is not here because they have a an arguably probably the most important role to play in making sure that the economic basics are in place, that the ports work, the roads, electricity, in order to get a truly competitive chicken sector. Uh, so would you say that uh, the whole objective of exports is sort of has to be put on the back burner until local issues can be sorted out? No, no not at all. Um, in, in fact, quite the contrary. I, I don't think we really have the time left to just kind of hope it all gets resolved. I'd, I'd argue that pressure has to be brought um, to deal with things. And I, here I'm not just referring to all of the, the, the truly big things, which no one on this call has any ability to affect, but even at the micro level, you know, I'm, I'm really encouraged to see that Astral, for example, um, have taken firm steps. I, I do appreciate it's a little unfair for them to kind of step in and take the role of the municipality, but they've also been very open about the fact that these are where the problems lie. And I think those honest conversations have been for a long time um, hidden. There's been a discomfort in being openly critical of government, lest there, there be some negative consequences. So I think those bold steps um, are incredibly important if we are going to have a successful export sector. Um, so perhaps you can talk more about how these local issues. Um, like the fact that we have limited electricity or water, et cetera, is, effect, is affecting the master plan in terms of expanding local production and particularly in terms of expanding and improving production among smallholder farmers. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine how any aspect of the economy or any part of the economy is going to grow if you don't have electricity. And we can't have an expectation that every factory needs to have the ability to generate their own electricity while still paying an inflated price to ESCOM, who's not delivering electricity. So that's obviously is a problem that has to be dealt with. Um, I'm also guessing that's not something that can happen quickly, but I can't imagine how the chicken industry, which I have to say, despite all of this, has had good growth. But you're going to have an automatic cap on how much you can grow if you can't get the water and electricity to your farm or to your production facility. Uh, no matter what else happens, you know, it's just it's inconceivable to me that you can ever grow beyond the rate that government can fix those infrastructural problems. Amanda, maybe you can elaborate on that from a, a farmer's perspective. So we've seen probably more load shedding in the past couple of months than we have over the past few years. Um, how, how has this affected your, um, your production capability as well as maybe other farmers that, um, that you interact with and that you work with? Um, Janine, thank you for the question. I'm fortunate to have um, a backup system or solar. I've moved over to solar since March this year because I run a small hatchery as well. So I had to invest in a solar and um, that has helped me quite a lot. And I'm doing layers. So I connected my lighting system on the, on the solar as well. But before that, um, I had to use a lot of fuel for backup generator for my for my um, incubation, and my, the lighting system was not connected to the backup for the layers, which affected production because, as we may know, layers need a strict lighting program. So once that is tampered with, um, production does go down. And then in, in relation to a lot of other small scale. Um, poultry farmers, especially broiler farming, um, it has affected him, uh, affected them quite negatively because um, the growth of a day-old chick is 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 um, 
uh, dependent on, on the heat that we can be able to provide for brooding um, purposes. So a lot of losses um, were, were, were gotten by, by the small scale farmers. A lot of them had their day old chicks die or in the first three weeks, they died quite a lot. We've had spaces where we discussed other methods um, to heat up the brooder, which include the use of imbaula and all of that, because at the end of the day, I mean, the mantra that was developed that a boot market plan was not there by mistake, because, um, you know, with all these challenges that we face, yes, at the end of the day, it means we have to spend more money, even if you use gas heaters, and, and you have to now get coal and all of that, we use more money um, to, to, to be able to fight um, the current challenges with load shedding. And um, so maybe we should move to Javet, then talking about production. Um, if we can maybe just talk about feed, animal feed, for example, which is obviously, um, I think most people would know, has sort of skyrocketed over the past year. Um, is South Africa anywhere near self-sufficiency in terms of feed production? Um, and if not, which I suspect is probably the answer, um, is this a necessity for the expansion of poultry production as it's envisioned um, in the master plan? Thank you, Janine, for that. Um, I, ha I have prepared a, a little slideshow, if possible, if can I share that, just to explain and talk you through it. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. You asked me, uh, are we self-sufficient? I just want to I go one step back and uh, just talk on the on the matter of where we started off and and I want to also touch base where Isaac has also alluded to to tariffs uh, anti-dumping tariffs that should have come in. Um, we all heard in the news, uh, read in the media, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that the claims uh, have been made that it's due to duties that the animal uh, the, the poultry uh, prices are inflated and uh, of course cost uh can i say food inflation is very important as well and and uh, and we truly appreciate that that we must have uh affordable food for the nation that is safe but the true fact of the matter is if you look internationally um we all know about coming out of COVID, that was quite an effect on us. And then all of a sudden, uh, in um, around about April, May, or end of March, uh, we all know about the uh, invasion of Ukraine by, by Russia. Now, if you can have a look on the screen, uh, the maize price and sunflower, which is quite an indicative uh, prices worldwide, you would see where our prices uh, are quite up to abnormal high levels. My next slide would explain it a little bit better. Um, you would see which um, I've explained prices. Uh, let's, let's first come to the energy sources of maize and sorghum. They were quite flat. You can see there at the bottom. And then of course we had hike with the Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, situation. And of course, if you, if, you, if you take a linear line, you would see, right, a linear line before the crisis and after the crisis, price levels are at higher levels and is predicted, price levels are predicted to stay higher than the linear line. So that answers the question of, will prices come down dramatically or what's gonna happen? Uh, I don't think prices uh, prices will now stabilize. Or I, I'm talking about commodity prices. 
uh, without any foreseen, I would say, any uh, unforeseen situations and, uh, in the world that can trigger that. Uh, major reason for, for, for the, uh, um, can I say, the hike in prices, we all know about the whole thing regarding fertilizer. You would see after the after the spike, because we know Ukraine and Russia is the one of two of the largest suppliers of of the of the fertilizer internationally. So the prices of uh, fertilizer has come back, and so that if you look at the left hand side, so did the uh, sunflower and soybean as well. So that, that prices will will stabilize a better, but still internationally at higher levels. So we can't expect uh, prices of, of feed, whether it's poultry or any other species, to come back to, to suddenly, uh, can I say, reduce to dramatic levels. I would, I would imagine price levels going forward in the short term would remain at these high, high levels due to what we can see. There's pressures internationally. Remember, uh, two big... Uh, going to say uh, drivers of this prices. China has, uh, due to African swine fever, lost a third of its uh, pork population. That is over 300 million pork, uh, pigs. So they're repopulating their herds. So their drive to, to, to repopulate puts an extra pressure on world stocks. And that goes for maize as well as soybean meal, the big, the, the big components into those products. And then, of course, uh, the whole situation in Ukraine and Russia, we all, uh, we should all be aware that the Europeans use wheat uh, for feed. Now, uh, they didn't have access or enough access to wheat, and they switched over to maize. So that push, that pushes back <clears throat> the pressure to maize. And that that's one of the second reason why the levels of maize prices are also remaining at quite high levels. But then, of course, if you look into the climatic and earth warming reasons, uh, there are some, some, some examples that's experienced in the US and uh, Argentina uh, and Brazil. That also is a concern uh, which might influence the, the prices. And that, that all said, uh, prices worldwide of commodities will, will, will stay at rather high levels. Then, um, if you look at our SAFEX prices, and thank you for the Grain South Africa's economists, you would see we are quite fortunate in South Africa. Uh, I just want to point out the, the green and the yellow. That's the, can I say, that's the prices of Argentina and uh, the U.S. export prices of May. The back line, you could see there, our traffic price at this level, around about 5.2. And why it's at export parity is because we have excess stock. We uh, exported more than 3 million tons of maize last year, uh, due to being able to have that and enough in our own market. If you look at the whole situation regarding uh, soya beans, and soybeans are, you can have a look at the trend line. The suffix price is around right about just under the 11. Also, soybean price is at export parity. And that's due to a, a, a huge success story in the soya value chain of producing uh, more or less enough for being self-sufficient. So I just want to show you that that's the sunflower. On sunflower, we also had a, a bumper crop last, last year. That's where we also, why we are at the export parity price. Going forward, it might be another story, but that's the crop in the, in the silos. And uh, of course, we must always keep in mind, South Africa are bound and linked to the Chicago Board of Trade. That's the international body, or can I say, exchange that uh, that determines commodity prices worldwide so we are derivatives from from uh, seaboard so please keep that in mind so we don't we are actually uh deriving our prices from that then um 
looking, you, you, you said you wanted to know a little bit more on prices. Uh, although that, although the, um, we had big crops, you can see there on the left, left hand side, and this is a source is a crop estimates committee. Uh, production of maize, we produced quite enough maize, more than the five year average. And yesterday, the, the crop intentions to plant came out. And the intentions is, uh, is still to plant enough maize at, this, at the same levels. But the intentions is to plant more yellow. So we as uh, South Africans, uh, if everything goes well, will expect our maize price to be at uh, export parity. But remember, it follows the CBOT trend. So it will remain at high level. Looking at soya beans, soya beans, uh, we had, a, you can see the success story of soya bean production over the years. We more or less now at self-sufficiency and the intention to plant actually rose uh, the, to, to a, can I say, a, a higher level. So we can expect, if you look at uh, the hills, around about the 2.4 million tons. So that's much higher than we have already. And that explains moving certain uh, vessels already been booked or some vessels that are already gone exporting uh, soyas. So soya beans will also remain at uh, export parity, but also please remain, uh, re remember there's no contracts, uh, can I say uh, local contracts for soybean meal and uh, sunflower oil cake in South Africa. So we can expect also export parity, but still linked with the Chicago Board of Trade, which will remain at higher levels. So in a nutshell, prices of feed will not come down dramatically. I think it will move sideways uh, where it is now, and it will move with the international market. So I'm just gonna stop here my presentation just talking on price. I can uh, retake uh, the presentation later on if we discuss other matters. Thank you. Um, so from what you were just talking about South Africa being bound by the CBOT prices, I assume then that that suggests that even if we were self-sufficient in let's say oil cake, um, it, it wouldn't change the fact that fee prices would, would still mimic those of um, if we had to support, if we had to import those products. Um, prices, uh, local prices, I mean, due to the high production of soybean meal and local crushing, the majority of our, our processors and animal feed manufacturers use local product. So, of course, uh, we internally uh, are, are being offered these products at huge discounts, of course, against the international uh, price, which moves it closer to, to import uh, export parity. So we're not at import uh, export parity, we're just a little bit higher than that. And of course, at the moment, uh, in that uh, price determination, of any product, it also in any product which has a tariff perhaps on it, there's always a, uh, in the model, the pricing model, there's also a, a import tariff that's applicable where there's import tariff on the books. Okay, so um, Amanda, um, I just want to go back to you because this is about, I want to ask another question about poultry production in terms of um, farm support. So obviously with um, feed prices, which are unlikely to come down, I mean, so it may trade sideways, but it's unlikely to drop. Um, electricity prices are likely to go up, so on and so forth. So input costs are going up. Um, are you sort of aware of any farmer and support initiatives being launched by government or um, anyone else, frankly, for that matter, um, to help smaller scale farmers or farmers in general who are now really getting close to possibly not being profitable at all anymore? 
Um, Janine, this is a very important question. Um, I, I, I also just wanted, before I answer your question, I just wanted to find out from Mr. Isaac what it is that a small scale farmer has to do or um, how do we qualify to form part of the 50 people that they said they would develop um, uh, in the poultry master plan, since now there's 18 of them that they said they've already developed. Um, we would like to also know how does a small scale farmer like me become part of the developed because those are part of the things that um, would make or break us as small scale farmers when we do not have the support, um, uh, the financial support or the market uh, entrance support, because some of us may be able to produce a certain number of chickens, but when we don't have the right market, then we might as well be producing for our neighbors or for our families and not make any money from it. Um, we are aware of all the price increments. Uh, there's another one that um, happened again recently. My supplier um, had their feed go up by 10 bucks where they buy. So it, my price is also gonna go up very soon. Uh, we are close to making no money at all. And the government had um, these, uh, Bessie vouchers, and apparently there is another uh, uh, rollout that is coming out recent uh, uh, soon. Um, however, even those type of systems are flawed because you may find that there's people that are selling Bessie vouchers on social media uh, to show that uh, that system is not run correctly. It's not given to the right people that are actually doing the farming. Um, but for feed, that is the only support that I'm, I'm aware of. Um, it's the basic vouchers that, that started uh, in, in, in 2020 as a relief to farmers due to COVID. We're not as subsidized as uh, 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 green farmers because green farmers are uh, being given seeds, they are given fertilizer every planting season. But with us, we have to wait. It happens. I mean, I've received it two times um, only. Some people have received one. Some people haven't received anything at all because the system is flawed. So you know, it would be it would be great to actually receive some of the things that are promised in the poultry master plan to actually, you know, I would love to be in, in a poultry space, in my spaces with somebody that can say, no, I've, I've been part of the people that got something due to the poultry master plan or because SAPA um, assisted me. I don't know of anyone as yet, and I don't know how much um, assistance they've the, the 18 people have been able to get uh, I don't know the criteria for all of those things so those are the type of things that as a small scale poultry farmers um you know we feel very much left out um because we we do need the assistance it, it is getting very rough some of us are only staying because of the passion now because we, we are digging into our own pockets to keep our businesses running Uh, it's like, would you like to just respond to some of Amanda's questions, perhaps? Yes, I can. I think that um, when we talk about um, farmer development or the creation of new contract growers and the establishment or growth of small farmers, um, it's two different processes. Um, uh, small farmers farming 1,500 or 5,000 or 10, even 10,000 birds will find it incredibly difficult to scale up to 200,000 birds. So we, we find that the people that qualify for financing um, for contract growing are people that has already got a substantial amount of chickens on the floor. There is a second program. And the second program, um, we're actually working with 19 farms at the moment. And those are either small farmers being established or um, farms that uh, small farmers that, that 
are being grow that are grown um, to become bigger and bigger. So those are the two processes. Um, the to get a contract from a, a, a company, um, the farmer must contact the company, and um, they will look at each individual case uh, before they allocate a a, a contract. Um, after a contract is obtained, uh, environmental impact study is ne needed, a water license is needed, and then that process goes to funding at the IDC. So that will be, um, um, in, in a nutshell, the process to be followed. Janine, if I may just uh, step in here. Uh, Isaac, while you're on there, this master plan was supposed to be a growth plan. So far, we've heard about the effect of feed on pricing. We have not heard the effect of tariffs. We've not heard that uh, anti-dumping duties really affect the price to consumer. Presumably, there are things that should have been done or could be done. Uh, and I wonder whether you could point to what those are in terms of the master plan. If we could just return to the master plan as a growth plan. Francois, I think that if we look at the master plan, um, it, it is a growth plan, obviously. Um, it is a long-term plan that we have. Um, and what we want to uh, uh, achieve in this plan um, would be firstly to have more investment and more, more growth of, the, of the, the size of the industry. And we do have that. Uh, per capita consumption is still increasing in terms of chicken. Um, a, a second major point is um, the fact that we are growing is creating capacity for us to do transformation. And we've talked about contract growers and also other farmers that are not contract growers. Um, a third component of it is that we need to create markets. Um, those would be a local market growth. And there's some initiatives in that, but that should be accelerated. Uh, secondly, export market growth. Um, a lot of work is being done behind the scenes to facilitate exports to the EU um, at present. Um, and we need to bring that to, to fruition. And, and then if we uh, lastly talk about what, what needs to happen is that um, the local industry can't compete with a, a dumped product or um, illegally traded product. And what I mean with that is product that are underdeclared um, in terms of price. Um, those fundamentals need to uh, uh, come, uh, need to be put in place for the industry to do these vast investments um, to grow the industry. Um, okay, so, sorry, someone wanted to add something? Yes, okay. I... I... I, 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 I had a question for Mr. Isaac and I don't feel answered. Um, I would like to know, so, so basically does the master plan and what SAPA committed themselves to mean that they committed themselves to developing people that are already doing more than 10,000 birds per cycle? So it doesn't mean that they, are, they, are, they were committing to developing us to get to that, because 10,000 birds per cycle, according to my knowledge, is a small scale commercial farmer. So does it mean that us that are already at the bottom here, there's no assistance that SAPA committed themselves to in terms of the master plan? And the second program that he says is there, I still don't know how exactly does one person a, a, a stand to benefit from it, or a small scale farmer stand to benefit from it. Does it mean that I must obtain a contract first and then pay for an environmental study from which money? Like, where is the development in that? The 1.5 billion that they said they are going to spend to develop us, or, or is it not us? Is it the, the people that are already doing more than what we, are, we can afford to do? 
Um, let me try and answer that. The, um, um, there's no requirement um, in terms of the master plan. It merely states that we will be um, establishing 50 contract growers um, over a period of time. Um, it doesn't say whether it's a big or a small producer. When With a poultry fund, there's a poultry fund at IDC, administered by the IDC, and um, I can't remember the amount of money involved in the fund at all. But um, if one look at the criteria for funding, um, then it makes it very difficult to scale up from um, a very small amount to a very big amount. Um, and that is simply the funding criteria of the, um, of the IDC. If we talk about the second group of people, small farmers that are already farming that wants to expand, um, or small farmers that uh, uh, that has uh, not been established um, as yet, um, they can also apply for um, um, funding from the IDC poultry fund. Um, and then, in terms of um, licenses and, and water licenses, and also business plans, um, SAFA has funded um, a, a number of those. Um, uh, um, in the past. So those are the type of assistance that's given. Uh, Vuka, I want to come to you um, now as we're talking about um, tariffs and anti-dumping duties. Um, so FAO has been vocal about its disappointment on the suspension of anti-dumping duties. Um, so can you perhaps elaborate on what FAO's view is on uh, Minister Patel's U-turn on parrots? Thank you very much. Um, maybe before I answer that question, I would, I would just like to make a turn to what Amanda was, was asking, because she was asking a very important question. During the master plan, when it was crafted and agreed by all stakeholders, there was never, a, in fact, we questioned this thing at that time. And the minister said, no, this is more of a license for us to start the actual work of um, protecting the, the, the sector and of course our economy. And now, Therefore, the decision of through the master plan is that there will be 50 uh, contract farmers, that's it. But the master plan did not detail or at least share the manner or the criteria of how to identify those 50 farmers. That's one of the weaknesses that I think we must share so that um, uh, uh, those who would have wanted to have access to information could not, like, like Amanda, she's asking this question, but this, this master plan was signed way before, meaning the committees, the subcommittees after the master plan was signed, they were supposed to discuss to say, in what way are we going to publicize information designed that we are able to attract all those who have an interest and who will be able to, you know, uh, have access to development and so on, because they have they have their own uh, issues. I know how to develop. I, I thought I should just raise that so that it is known as an issue in the process of uh, how to assist the small scale farmers. Because as as far as labour, yes, we represent workers, but in terms of our own position, we also support all those who are um, uh, small scale farmers. We want to see transformation where black uh, farmers, in particular females, uh, taking part in the entire value chain in the poultry sector. I thought I should just raise that part. Now, in terms of the question that you are asking to say, um, what is our view with regards to, I hope I understood it well, what is our view in terms of the tariffs or the, the import duties that haven't yet been, uh, is that the question? Yeah, what's your view on the um, suspension in particular? Um, okay, 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 yes. Look, the, 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 we, we raised already a high level of discontent 
in terms of the fact that the anti-dumping duties have been suspended. The reason is basic. The minister is very much aware of the experiences that we had before, wherein if they are, and I'm talking a situation where, or the period within which at the time, um, not that there was a suspension, but instead they were, but you will still experience uh, chicken dumping as it were by other countries such as Brazil, uh, Poland and so on. And when we were raising all those uh, you know, issues, it was, it was about the fear of, um, of, of the foreign chicken taking over our market to a certain extent that we, we, we were at the risk of collapsing the entire sector. That has been the argument and that was proven at the time because the, 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 the market share, the, the foreign uh, chicken in the market went you know, way up as expected and it crushed the, the local uh, poultry supply. Now, if the minister is, is now suspending the, 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 the anti-dumping duties, you may not see it at an immediate or you know, just after the announcement, but instead in the long run, this will of course be, so, sorry about that noise, um, but in the long run, what will happen is that the, 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 the importers, and I must record to say we are not against import products or importing products because we do have products that uh, we allow or within the country. But I'm saying the, 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 the ratio of imports and export, it's an issue here. So when you suspend anti-dumping duties, you are most likely to you are most likely to allow the importers to take advantage of the situation. And then you experience the influx of, of chickens from other countries. And when they are sold within the country, they are to the larger extent, take over the chickens uh, that are owned by or sold by uh, Amanda and others. And in this case, it becomes an unfair trade to, to Amanda and the rest because their chicken will not necessarily, she just spoke right now to say she will have to increase the cost of chicken. Now, if that's the case, whatever, how does she compete uh, fairly in the market in the event that there are now chickens that are way cheaper than what she's trying to say, which then the issue of her uh, taking from her, uh, or her pocket becomes even worse and most likely in the, in, in the long run, she will have to close the business. So we are therefore saying it is, it is not proper for the, for the minister to have, um, to have suspended the import, uh, import duties, but the minister at least was supposed to pronounce the definite uh, import duties for purposes of protecting the local supply of poultry. That is our position. Thank you. Uh, Tzbila, uh, let me turn to you then on, um, on in that regard. So I think the main reason used for the suspension of anti-dumping duties um, is that it will uh, decrease the, the cost of chicken products that consumers buy um, at retailers. Um, do you, is, is that true? Is um, our anti-dumping duties effective in actually bringing down chicken prices on the local market for consumers? Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Janine. Uh, Julia, I've already raised my hand just to add on what uh, we were saying. So if uh, we are just to track back as far as June, uh, when the anti-dumping uh, situation was, was brought in, um, if, if we are looking into prices, uh, by prices I mean like both um, spot prices, that is a suffix, um, uh, producer prices, as well as retail prices, um, at the moment we cannot say it, it, uh, that the anti-dumping has had that in, an impact that is the one of reducing prices, particularly for chicken or poultry in general. 
uh, given that it's only been three months. Um, um, so it, it normally takes time for, you know, for, for prices to generally uh, reflect what has been uh, happening in terms of the market that is feed price and all that. So at the moment, that uh, uh, anticipation, it has not happened. We haven't seen the, the decline in prices. If there's anything that I think is, is, is visible or observed from the data, both uh, all that is the, the spot prices, uh, they, 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 the poultry prices have been pushed by issues that have been always been there. That is the, the rising uh, feed prices, as uh, I think the, the colleagues from AFMA have mentioned that. And that, of course, it's something that is not uh, unique to South Africa. It's a global situation. So therefore, we cannot say that that um, based on the numbers, or at least the data that we have, um, the, the anti-dumping has had that impact of reducing uh, poultry prices. Actually, if there's anything that I've seen is that uh, a number of poultry products have, have generally increased um, since uh, June uh, to now, uh, given that I've just uh, have access to that uh, data until the first of, I think the first few weeks of, of October. So at the moment, there hasn't been that impact of reducing prices. Yeah, okay, that, that will be for now, Jimmy, thanks. Thank you. Um, and then could you also perhaps speak about um, the impact on consumers of vat-free chicken um, or vat-free chicken feed, um, as well as the impact of that on um, smallholders? Um. I think uh, like generally now, uh, and, and this is something that is not unique to South Africa as well, is that uh, poultry demand is uh, is uh, somehow uh, increasing. And then there's a, there's a number of reasons uh, around that. Specifically for South Africa, it is it has to do with the affordability of it. In fact, even one if to compare the, the poultry prices specifically, to other uh, affordable cuts of meat to other to other products, you will see that some of the reason that they were seen an increase in prices, it is because it is affordable and therefore the demand for it it's uh, increasing because people uh, at least the majority of the, of the of the folks in South Africa cannot afford the expensive expensive uh, you know products. So I think the issue of 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 it is something that I think has been uh, increasing in terms of debate understandable so given the situation in South Africa we have economic wise and also giving looking into the outlook uh, in terms of uh, folks being able to afford stuff. I think that is something I think in the near future, even actually now is gonna gain that, uh, you know, that momentum in terms of there should be no takes in that because of the importance of the product to the majority of the of the people. So um, I, I cannot necessarily say that it's um, it's something that is going to be implemented or whatever, but I think it is it's something that is going to be discussed given the current you know the current uh, economic challenges and of course uh, the the poultry being it's uh, uh, most of these affordable uh, animal products that I think uh, folks in, even even in, in Africa by the way uh, generally now actually I've been looking into the numbers um, uh, globally it's not South Africa only. We need to, I think we need to also understand that poultry is affordable to everyone in the world. And in fact, uh, Asia, China specifically is leading in increasing, um, you know, their imports of poultry, uh, followed by Latin Americans and then Southern Africa in general. So, but Southern Africa is leading to that because of the economic issues, as I've mentioned, and also that a lot of people are going for it urban areas. So there's a need to somehow try to make sure that we are increasing our production, at least to deal with all those. But it is not something that is unique for South Africa, but of course we need to have some sort of plans, be it tax-free or other means to ensure that we keep uh, the, the quality prices at uh, relatively reasonable prices. Thanks for now. Francois, would you like Janine. to add something? Thank you, Janine. I hope you can hear me properly. The issue is that there's no point having a plan if the participants to the plan don't implement it. And in this regard, both the import exporters and the government have failed miserably. 
And this is what we should focus on, I think, is not to have a new plan, but to actually execute the plan everyone has agreed. Part of that plan is to contain exports by ending dumping. Dumping is wrong. It's, it's not illegal, but it's wrong. And it's against the rules of the World Trade Organization. Therefore, we don't have to argue whether the minister did a, a, a right or a wrong thing. He did a wrong thing. He acted against the international rules by provisionally allowing dumping. Secondly, if we look at how to help the poor in South Africa, it is very clear that an immediate discount of 17% on consumer prices, retail prices, by scrapping value-added tax on chicken, is the simplest, most effective, straight, immediate relief. And it could be contained to certain pieces, those much used and bought by poor people. If we then combine these two things, as well as the absence of government on this panel, I think it leads us to the matter of negotiation, consultation, and communication. Government seems to have decided that all three of those things are no longer necessary. Our impression at Fair Play is that the government is willing to make promises to small scale farmers as long as they don't have to deliver anything and then try to make it the problem of other people. And I think what has to end is this solo riding by government jockeys. We are all in the same boat, but as long as government agrees a plan, reneges on the plan, and then starts punching holes in the boat, we're all going to sink. And that is why for fair play, the plan has to be to execute the plan that everyone agreed. Secondly, to ensure that we help consumers by lifting value added tax on chicken pieces, South African chicken pieces, and then lastly, to help small-scale farmers who are not all registered for value-added tax by lifting value-added tax on chicken farm. All of these things put together would have a real effect on the consumer price. I am proposing that that should be the focus instead of government acting unilaterally against the agreements they have already made. Thank you, Janine. Thank you. So, I mean, this discussion could carry on forever, particularly in terms of smallholder support, which um, is something that Farmers Weekly is particularly passionate about. Um, but unfortunately, I see it, we, our time is running short. Um, so I think before we start taking some questions from the audience, um, if we could just go around the panel um, and if you could say what priority actions you think are needed right now um, in order to keep the master plan on, on track or get it on track. Um, as well as perhaps um, changes that need to be made to the master plan. Um, okay, so Donald, let's start with you. So very hard to argue with Francois's um, vat-free chicken and feed. Um, I, I, I don't know how successful that will be, but uh, certainly has my support. Um, Regarding just maybe some factual issues. So just the anti-dumping duty was not removed. It was just never implemented. And so that would explain why we're not seeing a reduction 
in the price. It's just the tax that hasn't been put in rather than the tax that was taken away. Um, just something else, though, which is we the, the domestic industry is certainly not without protections. The duty rates on chicken are high. Um, and I take Francois's point on the dump, but we are talking, if we talk bone in chicken, which is typically the contentious product, there is a 62% duty, which, which is you know, one of the highest uh, levels of duty we have in the whole tariff book. And we've also seen over the last four years, a 50% drop in the import volumes. Um, so the you know the, the the duties have been effective um now you know does it is it enough to satisfy sapa the domestic producers that's a different issue but um the duties have had an effect so 50 percent drop we've gone from uh, 240,000 tons in the period september 2018 to august 2019 and if you look at the equivalent period to august 2022 we're down to about 120,000 tons so certainly there's the, the, the growth of the domestic industry, its profitability and its market share um, has not been insubstantial over that period. Uh, yeah, I, I would disagree with the ministers, or should I say, um, Isak and, and Francois' view on the minister, what the minister had to say. I think there is a question at, of the balance here. So I'm not someone who believes we should have absolutely free trade with no duties on anything at all. But I do think at some point there is a there is a cost to all of this. The domestic industry has, uh, I understand they have issues with things like feed, but it's not a uniquely South African problem either. But there has there have been some significant wins for the domestic industry. And I think at some point, the consumer does, you know, it does fund um, the duties that get levied on these products. And as to why it doesn't get passed through to the consumer, um, that I, I would believe at least is very much a function of a highly concentrated retail sector who determines what the prices are that products ultimately go to the consumers. Um, so whether, you know, is there some rent seeking from some companies? Quite possibly. But I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that if, um, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that the the prices would be higher. So there's a countervailing effect um, of having the duties. The duties were not there. The prices would would in all likelihood be higher than they are at the moment. Uh, they're very unlikely to be at the same level. So that'd be my take um, on all of that. Thank you, Janine, and I shall keep quiet. Uh, uh, Dve, would you like to give your sort of final thoughts? Yes, thank you, Janine. I just want also want to link up what Francois said, and uh, we must go back to uh, oh, can I say yeah, the original situation. Um, we must remember this is a growth plan, and uh, in our view, uh, we don't we don't foresee that imports will be stopped in totality. We must be realistic about that. So in certain cases, imports would be necessary, but uh, we are all for fair trade. Excuse the pun. But I want to link up the two. What Francois said is the growth plan and not having the duty in place and, and what imports is costing us as a supporter of the poultry plan and also the larger supplier to, to SARPA. I just want to put up a, a little slide to explain what I what I what I mean with this, and we take it uh, that it is a, a total value chain approach. It's not only the feed manufacturers; it's also the value chain upwards and downwards. If you have a look at my uh, at my screen, I just want to share it. If you look at the screen, uh, you would see that. Uh, FMA is the largest uh, supplier of poultry feed. We supply 99% of all broiler feed in South Africa and 81% of all laying hens feeds. So that's quite a number of <laughs> feed. So, but to do that, we use, to do that, we use 31% of 
the, the maize crop available for processing. So we're the largest single group of consumers of, of maize. And you can see there 97% of the soy crop that's available for processing and 78% uh, of all uh, sunflower seeds available for processing. So saying that it's not only the feed manufacturing industry, it goes back to the farmer of the maize, the farmer of the soyas, the farmer of sunflower, and even the jobs created within the feed, on the farm, etc. So it's a whole knock-on effect in the whole value chain that at the moment we're feeling because, okay, that's just the manufacturing. You can see uh, AFMA represents uh, around about 60% of the feed. But I think this is the more important part. Where I calculation or equivalent calculation um, from figures that I received, uh, you, you can have a look uh, from 2017, uh, the chicken import in ton, how much that the equivalent of feed, and of course the equivalent of maize and soyas. Uh, the whole matter here is this import replaces our local feed. And of course, maize, soya. And of course, if you check what average mill sizes are, it's from 2017, you can see the same stats. On average, this imports replace around about, say, 12 average sized uh, feed mills in South Africa. And that, that of course, around about, uh, on average, 2,200 jobs that's just gone because of imports. And that's the link I want to make uh, in terms of this, that it's a value chain approach and it's a growth plan. So if we, and, and very important link to this, uh, I spoke about imports that uh, we can't stop in totality, but that should be curbed and uh, do, the, the import should be fair, but linked to that as important is developing an export market. Because if you don't have an export market to, to, to allow growth of your local industry to become bigger, the prices will implode. So it's like a pressure cooker. You must have an outlet as well. So with that outlet being created, we will grow this market and we can make space for local growth in the, not only for feed, not only for poultry, but also for our maize, soya farmers, and all the other role players in this whole value chain. So it is a fine balance. So it, all partners need to do their part to do this. But at the moment, we don't see government moving on. Uh, we know about the import tariff that's been just suspended for 12 months, but we don't see on the out, out, uh, out um, can I say, the export side. We don't see, see much movement on that. And, and Isak has alluded to that, and, and a lot of uh, issues on that topic is export-related, SPS measures, et cetera, et cetera, requirements that we have to do that we can get entrance into the market access of the European Union and other market spaces. So it's a fine balance, which I would like to see, and uh, I would really like to see uh, all the role players doing their bit for this master plan. Thank you. Uh, so before I come to you, uh, Deves, I just want to ask, so do you think that the master plan in its current form is a good plan, it's just not being implemented, or do you think it needs to be adjustments made to the plan? I think it's a good plan, uh, and, and a good plan, of course, the, the result is always in the execution thereof. There are certain parts which I in my personal capacity and, and also AFMA's capacity, I think that uh, should be adjusted. That should be adjusted. Uh, and uh, uh, can I say more, I would say aligned towards sharpening uh, of the focus of uh, remembering this is, a, this is a growth plan. What is needed for growth? Because if we don't uh, make grounds on the exports, uh, we're all sitting ducks. And, and uh, we're going to compete against each other in the internal market, and we know what effect that will have on, 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 on our sector. 
So it's essential that we create that export market. And uh, I think uh, ISAC's members are are sitting and is in the blocks and waiting for this to happen. So it's it's all about refining, refocusing, and of course, at the end of the day, executing. So could you give us your final thoughts and also um, maybe just respond to um, what Devet and, and Donald um, said? Just your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, if, if I look at the, the master plan, and I think Francois alluded to the fact that we must implement. Um, we've implemented a, a, a numerous amount of actions um, within the master plan. There are actions that's currently slow that we desperately need to get traction on, and that is, um, um, I, I almost want to call it capacity within government to support exports. Um, that would be um, a very important one. And then I think we need to make the, the final um, decisions on the, on, on the uh, tariffs, as we've talked about it, the anti-dumping tariff uh, against Brazil and four European countries, but also the revision of trade measures. Um, in that, we've asked that the, the eight-digit import code be collapsed to seven digits uh, for our tariffs. We've asked for a, that we retain the ad valorem duty or the percentage-based duty but also have a reference price. Um, remember what we try to do here is merely to uh, bring product in um, at the, it's a, it can't be the legal price, but call it the correct price um, uh, that, that is fair um, to bring product into, into the industry. Um, that will be able to put us in a position where we will grow the, the feed industry and the grain industry. It will also give us capacity to do transformation and support uh, small farmers, contract growers within this particular process. Thank you. Sabile, can we have your final thoughts as well, um, particularly from a, an economic perspective in terms of um, what needs to be changed in the, the poultry master plan um, or what needs to be added or removed or adjusted Okay, th thanks, Jenny. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'd just like to say um, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting the, the sense of frustration from a couple of, uh, you know, a, a couple of, of industry players, uh, farmers and all that. Uh, I've been following the industry for some time, um, understandable so, given the circumstances and also the challenges that they are facing at their different uh, uh, operations. Now, with regards to the master plan, I think it is a plan, yeah, as, as it has been said. Um, of course, it is something that uh, uh, almost everyone needs to commit it to in terms of it uh, achieving its goals. And that, of course, it has to do with also the government, uh, you know, the, the, the private sectors, all the guys that are involved in it somehow, one way or another, be it is in the form of advisory, advisory or analyst and all that. So I think it's something it's, it, it can yield some some positive results uh, uh, on top of what is already achieved at least uh, from from my angle. But I think of course there had to be a bit of you know clarity from a couple of things that have also even today that have been raised. Um, I think uh, that will make a couple of people at ease in terms of not questioning a lot of what is happening with it. Um, yeah, so th th that will be from, from my side. And also now with the issue of import and export, um, it's of course something that I think it's, it's a very crucial. If uh, one was to look into the data, for example, for the first six months of this year, both imports and exports have increased in, in South Africa. Um, and there's been, of course, challenges to that. But now if we are to put in the issue of export, for an example, because it's something that a lot of people have been vocal about, a lot of things has to be addressed. That is the issues of electricity, generally the inputs that go is to into that. You cannot be in a position to, uh, to, to, to compete with Brazil where they have a lot of, even by size of farmers in Brazil to go in on farmer, you need a plane, like a helicopter to move from one side to the other side of it. So their inputs in terms of production, they have that advantage. 
in South Africa, we have a lot of different issues that we need to address, infrastructural problems that one, I think all of us are, are looking into those. In fact, they have been talked about a lot and it's not because it's something that uh, has been ignored, just that I think uh, there has to be a bit of focus in, in everything that we want to do. Uh, other than that, uh, I think the plan, the master plan, it's something that we can work on it, just it needs a little bit of commitments from, from all of us, including the state, uh, you know, the, as it has been said, uh, the, from all the industries, be it it's in feet and, and everyone that is involved with it. That will be it for, for me uh, for now. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, of course. Amanda, in terms of um, what you expect from, from the master plan, do you think it's, it's a work in progress? Do you think that there should be a greater emphasis on farmer support? Uh, just what are your final thoughts? Um, I think we would like to be more involved as small scale farmers um, in, 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 the, in the master plan. I would like for it to be very specific um, in terms of how do we get the support and who exactly gets the support that is um, said to be given to people uh, in terms of the development, if it can be more specific. Um, because it, 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 when things are, are not written down and specific, then it's very easy for people to dilly-dally and not commit to anything. Um, and we support the removal of, um, of that on feed because um, we have been trying to, to find ways to be able to, to benefit from that. And we only found out that um, it basically means that we have to be registered for that in order for us to have that removed on our feed. So if they can afford to remove tariffs, I think that can be afforded to be removed uh, on the feed because in most cases they're not. Um, I think the, the reason for the removal of tariffs stemmed from uh, supporting the consumer more than it supports the farmer, uh, which would lead to us being like Ghana, uh, whereby now billions of rand of their money is being used to develop. Um, Mr. Francois, your microphone is very disturbing. Um, to uh, 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 to develop their, their 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 poultry sector because now chicken started costing the amount of steak. Um, when now we can still afford to have chicken costing 50 rands per kilogram. Uh, imagine now in SA when we are having 119 rands per kilo for, for chicken. It would definitely mean that we are at the mercy of the importer. So it would be great to actually get the development that is promised in the master plan and for it to not be limited to people that are already developed enough or that already have enough money because there isn't a person that can have 10,000 chickens in their coop um, per cycle that doesn't already have a market. I can't now start a, 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 a raising anything above 5,000 unless I have a stable market for those chickens. In order for us to be able to grow and actually pay less on cost of feed, we need to scale up. And in order for us to be able to do that, we need to be developed, we need to be supported. So we need the poultry master plan to actually support small scale farmers because a small scale farmer is not anybody that has money to raise 10,000. That is not small scale to me. Thank you. Okay, finally, um... Could you give us your your final thoughts and how the master plan is either working or not working or what needs to be changed? Okay. Janine, who who, who did you address? Okay. 
Buka. Buka. Yeah. I think you're wrong. <laughs> Maybe Buka has a technology challenge. Yeah, uh, maybe Francois, maybe you want to um, give a summary if Buka comes back. Oh, wait, wait, I think he might be back now. Yeah. Buka? Yes. No, Can we have your final thoughts, please? Yes. The, there's, there's nothing to be changed in the master plan. The, the, the master plan carries uh, key decisions. All what is expected is all the stakeholders who made commitments to follow those commitments and make sure that the master plan succeeds. We also as workers made a commitment of increased productivity. You had um, uh, Isaac talking along those lines and the support that we are giving to the uh, to the to the sector is in line with the master plan. So the expectation, however, is that when there is a master plan that has to be implemented and it's not, then it becomes an issue. For example, if, if we were to uh, not clearly define the expectations of subcommittees in terms of the small scale farmers in ma the manner in which they are going to be supported and the demographics that has to be followed because our, our um, a point initially or what is captured in the master plan is uh, increased productivity and worker development through skills development and employment equity. Meaning you, or you provide skills in the workplace but you also provide skills to people who are outside the workplace, like Amanda and everyone else who cannot afford. So here we expect the same from the master plan. And if that is not happening, it becomes an issue. The, the other thing that uh, we must also raise is the, 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 the export issue. The fact that we had a master plan, one of the core issues was the fact that we, we are not succeeding in terms of the export, because if we, it were to be the case, we were going to have a, a, at least a positive spin-offs in terms of um, the, 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 the sale to, you know, to other countries if we open the market there. And unfortunately, we have, we have not been there. But the, the other thing that conforms with skills development that we, we made mention, if you had the, the, the hindrances of export is also revolving around technology. Now that technology will one way or another come to the same sector. It is already happening in the agro-processing. Now, if it comes to this sector, you will have a list, a number of workers who are going to lose jobs because of technological development. So part of what we submitted was to say, provide skills, that will enable those who are within workplaces to be able to perform and increase productivity. That's one. Secondly, to make sure that their aspirations are also uh, supported by the big players in the, in the sector so that by that time, there's new technology, you still have workers who have skills and be able to contribute to the growth of the sector and as well as our economy. So unfortunately, we are not there yet, but at least we, we, we do see some progress by other stakeholders, but the government in particular, we, we invite the government to be directly involved in making sure that this uh, succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Francois, would you like to give your final thoughts as well as perhaps provide a summary um, of the discussion today. Um, and then once you're done with that, then we'll take a few questions from um, the audience. Thank you, Janine. Thank you. What I heard in common was that the master plan has not been implemented in full and that in fact, what's outstanding is mostly in the lap of 
government as well as the import export uh, association secondly what i heard was that chicken is the most common uh, and the most loved meat for south africans there is no meat on the vat free list and that chicken should be vat free the definition of what it is actually in terms of whether it's a vat uh, free uh, full chicken uh, some chicken pieces south african produced that would be uh, decided but the idea of vat free chicken was common thirdly we have heard that not enough is being done to support small scale farmers and that it cannot simply be left to the big producers to do the government's job which is development vat on chicken feed is an important issue it's also to be lifted but that should we should look at the whole value chain and that is maybe something that could be uh, a new innovation in the master plan however the overall uh, theme that i heard is that the plan must be executed the signatories have signed they've made the commitment and it's not good enough that only some signatories like the producers have executed and the others are not executed last point i think everyone is frustrated with the lack of communication the lack of consultation and the lack of consistency from government and we need to see government's leadership step up not only do what they like to do but actually uh, comply with their duties once we have made some progress on all of these matters including anti dumping and we have seen the effect on the market then it might be time for a new master plan but until then this is the master plan and it must be executed as well as in terms of the poor people in south africa vat free chicken and vat free chicken feed for small scale farmers that's the summary i heard uh, i hope uh, i hope it's good enough for anyone uh, who's on this call to say yes i agree with that uh, other points may be that uh, you want to add something in your in your final comments or the audience may ask some questions that must be answered so janine i'll uh, leave it over to you to take questions from our audience thank you francois so uh, one of the questions that we received was um regarding trade with africa um so I'm not sure who wants to answer this question, but in terms of the African uh, free trade area agreement, is there scope for South Africa to perhaps um, export more to the rest of Africa in terms of poultry? Could I have a swing at that, Janine? Sure. So, uh, the answer there is absolutely, but, but that agreement is so far behind that I think we, we shouldn't expect any short-term benefits to flow uh, from the agreement, despite what the politicians are saying. Um, however, we shouldn't forget that we, we have an implemented SADC agreement. And I'd argue if we, if we can't get trade moving within SADC, then the idea that we're going to sell our chicken to Nigeria or some other country that is outside of this region uh, is even more remote. So trade will more likely happen to countries that are closer to us. And the further away we go, the harder that becomes, especially in Africa, where the, the cost of transport is absolutely crippling. And so we, we just we shouldn't forget what is on our doorstep. We, we have a functioning SADC agreement. We are part of a customs union, um, and those opportunities should be explored. And uh, if anyone wants to know more about that, they can contact me. We'll send them some information. Thank you. Does anyone want to add to that, or can I move on to the next question? Okay, thanks, Janine. I just wanted to add on what just uh, uh, Donald said particularly with the market. 
uh, it is not by coincidence that South Africa uh, export most of its poultry to its uh, to its neighbors, uh, specifically it's because of the cost uh, that is associated with it. But also, what I want to mention, um, I think there's one thing that I've learned uh, recently. I've been uh, I've attended a couple of uh, engagements, particularly those are that outside the country. Um, we, we, we in South Africa, understandable. So there are some sentiments, uh, at least negative ones. Uh, towards, um, you know, the, or at least the, the, the engagements between the politicians and what the industry in general want, want to do. Now, whether we, we agree or disagree with them, I think what is important is that there should be somehow engagements, both with them and, of course, within us. It absolutely is going to be critical for, for the industry to ensure that the politicians, they understand what the industry is all about and why it wants to achieve. A typical example is just here next to our neighbors, Switzerland. Switzerland is a very small country, but uh, I can tell you those guys, they have small scale farmers and all that, but they are doing very well. And the key to that, it has been the, the will from all the, the parties. Now for us, it's either we, we, we try to inform whatever it is that seems to be an issue between the stakeholders, the government, the distrust and all that, it's something that is going to be important. The same thing it goes for the Africa free trade. It's only began now. I think it's only like between um, something that has been traded from these East countries. Uh, it recently happened. It's a huge potential. But until we, we get into the issue of getting our politicians understand the importance of it, we're just going to be talking all, along all these things uh, in these spaces. It never going to get into that. And the screen, of course, we're going to bring the issues of government not doing A, B, and C in the respective of countries. But I'll tell you what, the importance of our communicating, communication from here, and then of course the message being echoed at a, at a, at a palatable manner into the folks that are gonna make decisions. And of course this time around, it has to be politicians. It is gonna be important. We cannot just ignore that. I just wanted to just say that, thanks. Uh, thank you. So, um, Amanda, one of the things you were talking about is involvement of um, smallholders in the discussion uh, when it comes to to the master plan. Um, so, there's a question here about whether there is sufficient transparency and con consultation between the minister um, of the DTI and poultry farmers and producers. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Um, I can speak for us small scale poultry farmers, and honestly, there isn't, because even with Afasa, um, that are sitting um on on stakeholders they're not mentioning anything in regards to um what it is exactly that is happening that is why we have taken it upon ourselves to try and register a non-profit organization where we can be able to also have our own people sit and and understand what is happening but for us we're very much clueless um there was a, an attempt um, we invited the Fair Play Movement to Poultry Spaces to actually, you know, give us a breakdown on what it is exactly that is happening in regards to what the government is saying and doing in regards to poultry farmers. Unfortunately, that was a futile activity because it was on the exact date when Mr. Patel had signed off the tariffs for the 12 months period. So we ended up not being able to actually understand what it is that is happening. So we feel there's no transparency for us as small scale farmers. Uh, so would you like to, uh, I mean, do you have anything to add to that in terms of, um, is there sort of, um, what's the word? Is there any sort of an initiative or any, sort of program that um, government is using in order to to get more input from smallholders or is it or from farmers in general um, or I mean how 
how how do you small scale farmers or even commercial farmers how do they interact or how do they get the opportunity to interact with um, policymakers on on these kinds of issues? I mean, maybe I can help there. Um, the the structures in terms of the master plan were that every quarter. Um, the, the, the full um, group of people that forms part of the master plan. So there are small farmer representatives, there are um, AFASAs, the labor union is there, uh, SAPA is there, or industry is there, importers are there. Um, we met um, every quarter uh, for the first two years of the, um, of the master plan. Unfortunately, that has stopped um, in the last year. And we don't have that interaction with the minister. Now, that is actually the forum that we probably need to revive or ask to be revived, where um, a small farmer like Amanda can give input um, into what their concerns are or what they see to be um, objectives to be achieved in time to come. Uh, I think that is the one purpose that uh, the, that forum fulfilled. The second purpose of that forum was um, to understand the decisions of the minister. Um, unfortunately, we are unable to get a meeting with Minister Patel um, to discuss various um, issues relating to the master plan. Those would be um, the tariff, obviously, but not just that. Um, uh, it will also focus on, uh, we need some help with exports, um, probably from the Department of Agriculture, but the forum is a forum where Minister De Disa and Minister Patel sits. Um, and that forum is not happening at the moment. Um, and we are calling for that to happen. And, and I think that is the frustration that Amanda is expressing and probably myself. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of, um, there have been a lot of comments and a lot of questions that are, are more or less similar. Um, that I think could possibly be addressed to um, some of the panelists um, individually. Uh, our contact detail, our contact details going to be made available. Uh, Franz, do you know if that's going to, if we can make contact details available to the delegates? Francois. Okay, everyone, I will find out and um, I'm sure we will be able to make those available to, to everyone who attended. Um, and then because we've run out of time, I think the floor is open if anyone wants to just say one final quick thing. Janine Isak, I would um, like to say, I think that the, the, the process of a master plan and a growth plan is an important strategic thing to happen in this industry. Um, not only to grow the poultry industry with the benefits we've talked about, but also get the benefits that, that the vet has spoken about. Um, both in the feed sector and the, the um, grain sectors. And if we look at that, this is actually a very big program that's got big impact and that we can't afford not to have. Thank you. Uh, if I can go in. Yes. Go ahead, Luca. Yes. Now, what I wanted to say, uh, firstly, to support what Isaac is saying, that it should continue. The, the, the point that I want to put across also is that the, we are not exposed to the reason behind why there is uh, no longer any transparency. We were uh, experiencing that at an initial stage, the minister and uh, her co his co-chair, Didiza, used to sit with all of us. And then we discuss, we craft and agree with the master plan. Subsequent to that, there were subcommittees formed for purposes of implementing the master plan. 
then there will be an oversight committee who will report to the same ministers. So at that time, at least there was progress because we'll discuss and, and, and measure how far we have gone with the master plan. That is no longer taking place anymore. That is why uh, uh, people like Amanda and others will obviously um, have issues in terms of uh, transparency. What I, I, I say is that because she's already here, please access the, the contact of Amanda we are willing as, a, as labor to interact with the minister, write letters, and we'll see how far we can go to resuscitate those interactions so that she can be part and other stakeholders also who are affected by the master plan so that there's progress in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, I'm just, are there any final comments or can I close? The, the meeting. Janine, if I may just add, sure. what we'll do is send around a, a sheet with uh, the common comments, those things on which we all seem to agree. We'd like everyone to uh, add what they think is necessary or delete what they disagree with or indicate what they disagree with. And hopefully we can then address this uh, together to uh, the ministers, uh, to government, uh, DGs, etc., so that they understand there is a real job to be done and that the parties to this discussion and others who've been on the discussion and not on the panel uh, have a real stake in what has to happen. Uh, we need urgency, we need execution. And thank you for hosting this. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for all the panelists. And thanks for everyone in the audience who were patient. And I'm sorry that we couldn't answer all your questions on this uh, time we have available on this uh, platform, but we'll do our best to make sure that you get the answers you, you require. Uh, several people have asked for a recording. I don't know the technical uh, issues around it, but we'll do our best to make sure that you uh, receive as much information from this meeting as possible. Uh, so, Janine, over to you to close it up. Thank you, Francois. So, I'm just going to be very quick, um, but I just want to say again on behalf of Farmers Weekly, uh, thank you to our panelists and the delegates, our delegates for taking time um, to engage with each other um, on this important topic. I hope that the summit has opened the doors for similar conversations to to follow in the near future because I think we can all agree that um, it's vital these sorts of conversations, uh, particularly with involvement from from stakeholders. And with that, I bid you all farewell.